apparently a month is forever with Peter. I don't know if anyone caught that there, but I hadn't been here for a month, so. Good morning. Um, For our first song this morning, let's turn to 29. For those of you that are able, would you please stand? Wonderful words of life, number 29. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words. Beautiful words. 
If you have a bulletin, we'll go over some announcements uh, for this week. Uh, this week at the CFC, Wednesday, July 20th, there's going to be a seniors coffee at 10 o'clock. Wednesday, July 20th at 7, there's going to be a baptism slash uh, discipleship class. And we're planning a baptism for August 7th. Uh, and if you're still thinking about membership transfers, uh, please talk to one of the ministerial. Friday, Sunday, July 22nd to the 24th, there's going to be a, a camping weekend at Rock Lake. And that's this next weekend. If you have any questions about that or if you're uh, going yet signed up, there's a chat that has been made for those that are going or that had signed up. Uh, so talk to Justin Monica if, if you do have any questions. Uh, prayer requests and praise items. Pray for Pastor John Wheeler as he prepares for next Sunday's message. Uh, for all those that are taking vacation and traveling, uh, looking here, there's a few people missing this morning. So there's people that are camping or are going out and about. So uh, let's pray for safety for those that are planning trips and stuff. Uh, let's continue to pray for those that are dealing with health issues. Frank and Margaret Cron family. Evelyn Onra, she has, uh, um, and I cannot say that word. I was practicing it at home. I don't know what it is. Scheduled for Monday, July 18th. So I talked to Evelyn about that uh, and pray for her. Uh, praise God for the young f uh, people who are coming forward with baptism. We now have four candidates, uh, Landon Gunther, Madison Penner, Kaylee Weeb, and Carly Penner. And th this is exciting. Um, most of these kids, or I would say probably all of them, that are coming forward for baptism were kids that were in youth when I was youth leading, and so that is really good to see. Um, often, as a youth leader, you think of, you don't see the growth, you don't see that acceptance, you don't see any of that maybe in youth. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But uh, my wife has often reminded me, we don't need to see the growth here. We're planting a seed, we're building relationships, and uh, the rest God will take care of. And, and here we are seeing these young souls coming forward to, to go into baptism, and that is truly exciting. So let's uh, praise God for, for that, and let's pray for these young souls as well. Missionaries to pray for this week, Mike and Rosaline Dirksen, and they're from the CMC Church Planters in St. Malo. Uh, back of the bulletin, uh, make a note on your calendar, August 14th, there's going to be a conference-wide worship service picnic at New Bothwell, and there's going to be some activities, bouncers and stuff for the children. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for us to see uh, the other churches in the conference and get to know some, some of them and, uh, and spend time in worship together. Uh, upcoming events, uh, there's a Pemina Valley Bible Camp is offering two sessions of family camp this summer, July 25th, 27th, as well as July 28th to 30th. And there's a little bulletin or a paper in the back as well. If you have any uh, questions or more information, go check that out. And at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Bill to play us a, a pursuit video from SBC. Good morning, CMC Conference family. Uh, I pray that you are all doing well today. Uh, CMC Mission Board update for July. So I want to start with our radio ministry. Uh, we uh, give support in uh, to 21 stations in six different countries uh, so that they can air our program. Uh, we also make it available. Uh, it goes out on WhatsApp. We, it gets uploaded uh, to uh, a place where different uh, uh, people and stations can download the program. So we know of it going out to at least six countries and 21 stations that we that we pay for it to go out on. But it also goes out to other locations and other stations uh, get paid for by sponsors and um, and things like that are happening. And so we're we're excited about uh, the opportunity that the radio continues to have. Uh, and online. So you can go to cmcradio.ca and if you follow the links, go to podcast. And I just checked it and the, the program is updated right through the end of July already uh, with John Wheeler's messages. So John Wheeler is our radio preacher. He continues to do that. He's doing well. I noticed that he just preached uh, a series on David. So if you want to listen to those, uh, go to cmcradio.ca, follow the links there and you can listen to the program. Uh, you can pray for uh, Rick and Anna Reimer as well. Uh, they're missionaries. Um, now they're at Winkler Bible Camp. It seems odd to say that because they've been at Cedarwood for so long, but they just, uh, they're just they they're currently in that uh, transition from Cedarwood over to Winkler Bible Camp. The official start date at Winkler Bible Camp will be August 1st for them. So they're excited that they found a rental uh, just outside of Winkler, um, and, and they're happy about that. Uh, their oldest son, Caleb, is still working at Cedarwood, and he'll, he'll join up with the family again at the end of August. Uh, you can also pray for Brett and Candice Lowen. 
uh, they know that uh, they're thankful for a fundraiser uh, that was held on June 10th specifically for uh, for the camp that they are running um, with uh, ministries to Africans in Canada. And of course, they help. Um, they, they work with uh, refugees uh, widely and newcomers to Canada on the whole. But they've been uh, looking forward to doing this camp for a couple of years now. And so they had a fundraiser. They raised seventeen thousand dollars. And so they're excited about the camp uh, that's going to take place on August twenty first to twenty sixth. Um, and so you can pray for that as well as the other things that they're involved with at Naomi House in Winnipeg. Mike and Rosalie Dirksen, they are our church planters in St. Malo, and that's been going on for a couple of years now. And, uh, and every, every report I hear is, is positive. There's a group of believers that's meeting in St. Malo, uh, and they continue to teach them uh, inside of the scriptures. And uh, people, newcomers, keep coming, and people keep going, and so there's a lot of transition there, but there's also a core group that continues to meet there. And so you can pray for Mike and Rosalie Dirksen as they continue to lead uh, the St. Malo church plant. And then I wanted to mention uh, Dwayne and Sylvia Gertzen again. And uh, so so you might remember that uh, it was August 8th of 2021 that two of their six daughters passed away in a car accident. And uh, so that process of grief is certainly an ongoing one for them. In their most recent uh, prayer update, they shared, I think, fairly honestly about, about that challenge, about going through hard times and dark times, and it continues to be a difficult journey. And, uh, and just some of the ways that they uh, have felt people come alongside and how people can continue to help them by praying for them and showing love to their children and, and, um, and these types of things. So I just want to keep Dwayne and Sylvia on your mind. They're at Rosa River Bible Camp, and so camp is, is of course, underway again. Um, and, um, you know, they share about how they are heartbroken. Camp was a family thing, and now that... that uh, family has been fragmented by these losses and so trying to find their place again at camp and find excitement at camp has been a challenge and yet at the same time there's been a renewed sense that um, that there's a need for people to come to know Jesus that the shortness of life is just a reality and the suddenness um, of life uh, and the ending of life is a reality that's uh, that they're very aware of as well too and so uh, you can continue to pray for them in those things um, I got to spend um, a week speaking there and then a couple more days um, and and uh, got to spend some time with Dwayne and Sylvia and I uh, find them just to be uh, honest um, people who want to uh, serve the Lord with honesty um, but they're uh, going through a hard, heartbroken thing and so we talked about God being strong in our weakness and, I, and it's true and you see evidence of that in their lives but what they feel is is weakness and so I think sometimes what we see is the strength of God working but what they feel what they experience on a day to day basis is weakness and we don't as human beings we just don't like to feel weak and so it's a nice thing to say um, it's a hard thing to feel uh, is weakness and so you can pray for them in that weakness in that heartbrokenness um, that God will just continue to go, go through them uh, go with them uh, through this journey uh, the camp is working on uh, on getting a new, uh, seems like a fairly substantial zip line. Uh, I think it'll be, uh, campers will really enjoy that. I think it's about $195,000 uh, project. They had close to 150000 of that in, and so they're looking to raise the last bit of that. Um, so that's positive for the camp. And then just pray for the for camp workers on the whole right now. Uh, uh, like, if you've ever spent time around Bible camp, I think, uh, there are some people working really hard, whether it's the counselors, whether it's the kitchen staff. Those are the two that jump out to me as some long, hard days. And uh, I've done counseling in the past, and, and I don't think I would have the strength to do it anymore. And, and yet it's such an important ministry, and so many kids are shown uh, love and, and hear about the goodness of God and, and about the work of Christ in their lives uh, during this time. So um, pray, for, pray for the camps uh, around you, wherever you are. Uh, I know that Preston too, you guys uh, run a Bible camp out there, and uh, I know that our guys in Winkler, you've got Winkler Bible Camp near you. Um, you know, Roso is often one that we've been associated with, but there's lots of Bible camps around you, and there's lots of good stuff happening there, and so continue to pray for, for those camps and all the work that's going on there. And if you have a chance to get involved to help out in some way, um, then I would, I would recommend you uh, take a chance to do that. God bless.
This is it. I was going to say they could call me the one take wonder, but we're on take three, so. And learning from each other. Living in community. While gaining valuable real world experience. What? What? What happened? I see students and living in community. Got it. This is it. Hi, my name is Randy, and I'm the director of our discipleship program called Pursuit. I'm inviting you to join us as we seek first God's kingdom through our unique, hands-on approach to spiritual growth, leadership development, and personal discovery. Pursuit is a discipleship training school for young adults who have a desire to follow Jesus, develop as leaders, and discover their direction for life. We take a practical approach to learning, meaning that everything we teach in the classroom, we spend time implementing in our day-to-day -day lives. We use experiential learning and missional experience to help our students grow. Every week, our students participate in learning from our instructors, being mentored by our staff, adventure team building and leadership experience, mission exposure opportunities, and spend time in worship together. From our home base on campus at Steinbeck Bible College, our students go out into our province, our country, and our world to learn from our missions partners. Our partners in Winnipeg, on Vancouver Island, and in Brazil give us meaningful opportunity to serve and to learn about the Kingdom of God across cultures. Pursuit students participate as a group in all of our classes and activities, learning from each other and living in community. Our team-based approach means that our students can explore their gifts, abilities, and direction for life while gaining valuable real-world experience and receiving helpful feedback from peers and program staff in an encouraging environment. To learn more and to apply, visit our website, spcollege.ca slash pursuit. Give us a follow on Instagram, at Pursuit SPC, and join us in pursuit as we seek first God's kingdom. I can't wait to get started. All right. So there'll be a slight change in our bulletin. We've done the mission report, so after the uh, children's story, uh, Justin will come up and do scripture reading. Uh, but thank you, Bill, for playing those videos. Uh, another note or announcement here in upcoming events. Um, the South Central Cancer Resource is a nonprofit organization, and they serve the community, community by providing rides for cancer patients, and they are in desperate need of some help there. So if you are able and interested in taking cancer patients to Boundary Trails, Winnipeg, or Brandon, uh, to get their treatments, uh, talk to Carla um, at SCCR office, 204-822-9541. Uh, and I think this is a, a good way and a good opportunity to be a shining light as a community to help each other in, in this way. So if you're able to do that, uh, make a note of that and talk to the South Central Cancer Resource Center about that. So um, that is all the announcements that I have. I'll ask the ushers to come, to come up and then we'll do a word of prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to uh, to get together and uh, praise and worship you, Father, and and uh, fellowship with one another and see smiling faces. And Lord, it is an encouragement uh, and it's something that uh, we as people need. And uh, Lord, if there is people among us that are, are struggling and feeling alone, Lord, I pray that uh, if they're here today, uh, that they are feeling uh, part of this uh, united family that's here. And Lord, I pray that they're encouraged as they go forward this week. Lord, we thank you for being our provider. We thank you for the sunshine and the rain and the beautiful crops, Lord. Uh, and we know that you're at work and that you're in control. And we are gracious for that. Uh, and Lord, I pray that you be here this morning. Uh, be amongst us. Lead and guide us. Lead Pastor Jake as he shares your word. And I pray that you speak through him. Lord, we also want to continue to pray for those that are struggling with health issues. We think of uh, Frank and Margaret Cron family as, as they're dealing with uh, their journey there. Lord, I pray that you also be with Evelyn Unra as she's got an appointment scheduled for this week. Uh, Lord, I pray that you be with her, give her calmness and peace as she uh, goes to that appointment. And Lord, we also ask that you continue to be with Pete and Eva as they continue their cancer journey. Uh, and I pray that you comfort and guide them uh, as they go through that. 
And Lord, there's, uh, there's a lot to be thankful for and praise for, Lord, but we want to thank you and praise you for the young souls that are coming forward for baptism. Uh, we think of Landon, Madison, Kaylee, and Carly. And Lord, um, as they go through this journey, Lord, I pray that you protect them. Uh, Satan is only going to come at him harder. And Lord, I uh, thank you for, for those beautiful souls that are making a commitment to uh, follow you uh, for the rest of their lives. And Lord, we also pray for all the missionaries that are continuing to do your work and build your kingdom in the busyness of the summer and camps and everything. Lord, I pray that you uh, be with them and grant them uh, the energy to continue to uh, work with the kids and whatever journey, if they're doing a church plant or running camps or whatever it is, Lord, uh, I pray that you be with them as they, they do that and that you bless them. And Lord, um, we have the opportunity to give back to build your kingdom, Lord, um, as we are so richly blessed in this area uh, and in this world with what you provided for us. I pray that we can give back to you with a joyful and thanksgiving heart. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sit on the stage. All right. This morning, I'm going to read a book that's called Have You Filled Your Bucket Today? All day long, everyone in the whole world walks around carrying an invisible bucket. You can't see it, but it's there. You have a bucket. Each member of your family has a bucket. Your grandparents, friends, and neighbors all have buckets. Everyone carries an invisible bucket. Did you know that? Your bucket has one purpose only. Its purpose is to hold your good thoughts and good feelings about yourself. You feel happy and good when your bucket is full. And you feel sad and lonely when your bucket is empty. Other people feel the same way too. They're happy when their buckets are full, and they're sad when their buckets are empty. It's great to have a full bucket, and this is how it works. Other people can fill your bucket, and you can fill theirs. You can fill your own bucket, too. So how do you fill a bucket? You fill a bucket when you show your love to someone when you say or do something kind, or even when you give someone a smile. 
That's being a bucket filler. A bucket filler is a loving, caring person who says and does nice things to make others feel special. When you treat others with kindness and respect, you fill their buckets. But you can also dip into buckets and take out some good feelings. You dip into a bucket when you make fun of someone, when you say or do mean things, or even when you ignore someone. That's bucket dipping. Bullying is bucket dipping. When you hurt others, you dip into their buckets. You will dip into your own bucket too. Many people who dip have an empty bucket. They may think they can fill their own bucket by dipping into someone else's, but that will never work. You never fill your own bucket when you dip into someone else's. But guess what? When you fill someone's bucket, you fill your own bucket too. You feel good when you help others to feel good. All day long, we are either filling up or dipping into each other's buckets by what we say and what we do. Try to fill a bucket and see what happens. You love your mom and dad. Why not tell them you love them? You can even tell them why. Your caring words will fill their buckets with joy. Watch for smiles to light up their faces. You will feel like smiling too. A smile is a good clue that you have filled a bucket. If you practice, you'll become a great bucket filler. Just remember that everyone carries an invisible bucket and think of what you can say or do to fill it. Here are some ideas for you. You could smile and say hi to the bus driver. He has a bucket too. You could invite the new kid at school to play with you. You could write a thank you note to your teacher. You could tell your grandpa that you like spending time with him. There are many ways to fill a bucket. Bucket filling is fun and easy to do. It doesn't matter how young or old you are. It doesn't cost money, and it doesn't take too much time. And remember, when you fill someone else's bucket, you fill your own bucket too. When you're a bucket filler, you make your home, your school, and your neighborhood a better place. Bucket filling makes everyone feel good. So why not decide to be a bucket filler today and every day? Just start each day by saying to yourself, I'm going to do something to fill someone's bucket today. And at the end of each day, ask yourself, did I fill a bucket today? Yes, I did. That's the life of a bucket filler. And that's you. Thank you for being good listeners. I have a coloring page to remind you to be a good bucket filler if you want one. I'm going to take one and then you can go back to your parents. This morning for scripture and prayer, I'd like to share from uh, Psalm uh, 95, verses 1 to 7. So Psalm 95, starting at verse 1. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. 
Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for all of our sins. We just want to thank you for all the wonderful blessings that you've given us, the wonderful weather that you've blessed us with. We just thank you for all the reminders that you've given us that you are in control. This land is yours, the mountains are yours, you created it, and we thank you for those reminders. Lord, we just want to pray that uh, you keep us safe and you put your hands of safety around each one of us as with our busy summer schedules, and the hustle and the bustle, and we just pray that you, you put your arms of safety around each one. We also want to pray, Lord, for those that uh, uh, have health uh, concerns, Lord, we just want to pray for healing if that is your will, Lord, and we also want to pray for uh, peace. We just pray that you put your hands of peace on them and their families and give them peace so that we may be uh, at peace with uh, what your will may be, Lord. We pray that your will be done and just give us the strength and the peace to be uh, at peace with those decisions. We thank you for this wonderful building that you blessed us with that we're able to come together and worship you. And we just pray that uh, this message be a blessing to each one of us and that we can take it and help it to build our relationship with you and go out and show the world that we are part of your flock. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning to each one of you. It's good to be here. It's good to see all of you. Definitely uh, looks like there's a few more empty spots this morning than what we've had a few times, but uh, it is summertime after all and people are on vacation and that is great. Uh, we took a couple of days of vacation ourselves this last week and, uh, and spent a couple of days with the grandkids at a campground and had a great time together. And uh, so it was uh, good to get back home as well, though, too. So uh, this morning's message is entitled Expectations. So if we think about expectations, uh, we, we all have expectations. Uh, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, between husband and wife or... or uh, uh, somebody that's that's just thinking of getting married, they have certain expectations of what marriage is and, and expectations of each other as they go into marriage as well. Or uh, there's expectations between an employer and employee. Your, your boss expects you to get certain things done a certain way, and as an employee, you expect to be treated fairly and given proper instructions and all of those things. So there's expectations going both ways in many, many situations, I could use a whole lot more examples. Another one would be possibly a, a builder and a homeowner. Somebody hires a contractor to build a house. Well, the, the, the owner of the property, he's got expectations of what that contractor is going to do. And the contractor has expectations of uh, that he will get paid when he gets the work, when he does the work. And so, and many other expectations that way. We could, we could think of many different ways that we all have expectations of each other. We have expectations of, um, uh, you have expectations of me, I'm sure. And I have expectations of you as well. Um, and so we have expectations of all kinds. My text this morning is from Matthew chapter 21. And you might think, okay, that's the uh, Palm Sunday text. And it is. Uh, but there's, there's some certain things in here that, that I had never, um, I guess, never thought about or realized until I read somebody else's uh, uh, document on this. And, and I thought, yeah, that's, there's, there's a whole lot more here than what I had ever realized. And, uh, and so we're going to read from Matthew chapter 21. And I'm going to read from verses 1 all the way to verse 19. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, 
Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did, just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their, and the, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Behold, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. Now in the morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, No longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Thus far our text for this morning. So I have, I have found in my years, not saying I'm old at all by any, by any stretch of the imagination, but I have found that sometimes when people come to God, they have certain expectations. They have certain opinions of what they think God should be doing for them. They visualize a God who is going to do what they want done. There was a certain uh, lady by the name of Donna. She had a conversation with her four-year-old niece. The little, little girl's mother was expecting another child. And so Donna asked this little four-year-old niece, uh, So, do you want a baby brother or a baby sister? The niece looked up at her and said, Auntie Donna, sometimes you just gots to take what God gives you. In other words, Aunt Donna thought that her niece would have expectations of what God would do for her, a baby brother or a baby sister. But this little girl trusted God and figured that God knew better than she did what was best for her. In our text this morning, we read about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the crowds were excitedly lining up along the streets of the city because their long-expected Messiah, their king, had come and they were they were just electrified. Now, if we do a little bit of background study on this issue, we find out why the Jews would have expected a Messiah King who would give them safety and security. And we find throughout the Old Testaments, we find that God's prophets, they keep beating on that topic like a drumbeat. Jeremiah 23 verses 5 to 7, for example, says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. Zechariah 6, verse 12 and 13 echoes that promise. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And then of course, there's the passage that we're all very familiar with from Isaiah chapter nine, 
uh, verses 6 and 7, where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. That was the promise that the Jews had been given throughout the Old Testament. A promise that a king would be born to give the Jews exactly what they needed. And the Jews had studied hard to find out what they could about this Messiah king. Uh, so, so hard that they even knew where this Messiah was going to be born. When the wise men came to Jerusalem seeking him who was born king of the Jews, the chief priests and scribes, they knew exactly where to look for that information. And they looked in Micah 5 verse 2 where it says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are too little among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me the one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And they even knew that when he would come, he'd come riding into the city on a donkey. Zechariah 9 verse 9 declared, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So they had this expectation, this expectation of the Messiah, and it had reached a fever pitch by the time of Jesus' ministry, and even afterwards. Um, history tells us in the time before Jesus was on earth, there is a list of at least six men who claimed at some point to be this Messiah, this King. And they all died at the hands of the government at that time. Why did those Messiahs die? They died because they believed that the Messiah was to be a military leader who would lead his people in armed conflict and overcome their enemies. And so these Messiahs were trying to fight the Roman government, and they lost. This is what the crowd here on Palm Sunday was expecting. They were expecting a military general and a conquering king. And Jesus fit the bill absolutely perfectly. He was a highly influential man. People had come from miles and miles around to hear him speak. He was a very charismatic leader. And so if he would take charge of Israel's army and lead them into battle, they'd be unstoppable. If his soldiers were wounded on the field of battle, he could simply heal them with a touch. Or if they were hungry, he could feed them with just a few fish and a couple of loaves of bread. And if they died, he could raise them back to life. No army on earth could hope to oppose Jesus. But the problem was, the crowds at Jerusalem didn't realize, in the words of that four-year-old little girl, sometimes you just got to take what God gives you. The king that these folks wanted wasn't the one that God had in mind. In their imaginations, they had created a promised king who met their expectations. There was uh, a college professor at one point, uh, I don't know what, what college, but his name was Scott McKnight. He taught a class on, on Jesus of Nazareth. And he said on the opening day, he gave his students a standardized psychological test that was divided into two parts. The first part of the test was about Jesus. Students were asked to imagine Jesus' personality. And he had questions in there like, uh, do you think Jesus preferred to go his own way rather than act by the rules? Uh, was Jesus a war warrior? And then uh, those were the type of questions on the first part. And then the second part of the test was asking basically the same questions, but instead of asking, was Jesus a warrior? It asked, are you a warrior? And this professor said that this test revealed that the students all thought that Jesus was like them. Introverts thought Jesus was introverted. Extroverts thought that he was extroverted. And so the professor's conclusion after this test, to one degree or another, 
we all tend to shape Jesus in our own image. We all have our own picture of what we expect Jesus to be. Now that may not always be true. But that is what was happening here to the Jews. When Jesus rode into town on that Palm Sunday, the crowd had already shaped Jesus into the kind of Messiah that they wanted. And that is why Jesus did the things that he did next. Right after the parade, Jesus went directly to the temple. And in verses 12 and 13, we're told that Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who sold and bought in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of, den of robbers. Now Jesus had already done this once before. In John chapter 2, verse 12, we read the, the other account of where he cleaned out the temple, cleared out the temple. Uh, he'd, he'd entered the temple, he drove out the greedy and the manipulative merchants from the holy temple. But now... Why, why would he do that? Why would he not just leave these guys alone? Well, perhaps because Jesus was making a point. Because after entering Jerusalem, Jesus could have gone directly to the palace of David, which was just down the street. And if he had done that, he would have been declaring that he was an earthly king who had come to create a new Israel that he could lead to begin a war. He could have declared that he had come to conquer the whole world by fire and sword. But he didn't do that. Instead, he went to the temple, the holy place that was dedicated to God. Why did he do that? Jesus did that because he was declaring that he had come to be their king. But he had not come to lead them into battle against the Romans. He had come to lead them into righteousness and holiness. Now this is what it means to us as Christians. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it says... Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Your very body, our very bodies, is the temple of God. When Jesus became or becomes our king, he comes to clean us up from the inside out. Because we are his temple. Now we, we know that church buildings get dusty. They get dirty. And usually once a year or so there's a, there's a spring cleaning that happens. And we also know that churches are filled with people who are greedy. There is selfishness. There is self-righteousness. A building is just a building. It's not a church. We are the church. And unless you and I are cleansed from the sins of our lives, unless the King, Jesus, comes in and cleans out those sins from our lives, the church buildings are irrelevant. Jesus didn't come to clean up church buildings. He came to clean up his temple. Us, our bodies, are his temple. He came to turn our lives upside down and drive out the sins that once ran our lives. So that's what the cleansing of the temple was all about. It was declaring to us that when we signed up to belong to Christ, when we believed in him and repented of our sins and confessed Jesus as our Lord and Master, we had signed up to have our lives changed by him. Our four baptism candidates were already mentioned this morning, and, and it's exciting to, to, uh, to see that and to, to work with them as we go through some discipleship classes. Uh, I've only been at the one. I was away last week, but I was at the first one, and it was exciting for me to be able to do that again. It had been a while since we had a baptism class. But this is what it's talking about here. When we believe in him, we repent of our sins, we confess Jesus as our Lord and Master, and then we are baptized. 
That means we've signed up to have our lives changed by him. Our lives will be forever different. But one thing we need to remember, we cannot just come to him and stay like we are. Someone once said it this way, God loves you as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. So Jesus cleansed the temple here because he was declaring that his kingdom would be holy. But he wasn't done yet. In our text today, we read, in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry, verses 18 and 19. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit come from you ever again. And the fig tree withered at once. Jesus killed a fig tree? Yeah, what's that all about? Didn't he like figs? Had he gotten up on the wrong side of bed that morning? Was he just in a bad mood? No. Because you see, Jesus only had three years to establish the groundwork for his coming church. And everything that he said and did was calculated to teach us something about what he wanted from us as his followers. And this is especially true of the killing of the fig tree. It was a deliberate act, and it was meant to send a message to us. So, simple question. According to our passage from Matthew 21, why did Jesus kill the fig tree? Well, the answer is, it didn't produce a fruit. John the Baptist taught his uh, the people that, that, that uh, followed him or the people that he preached to, uh, he, he, they came to him to be baptized and, and he taught them that every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Luke 3, verse 9. Here in Matthew 21, after Jesus killed the fig tree, he told the chief priests and the elders of the people, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. We didn't read that far, but it's a little further ahead in chapter 21 and verse 43. It says exactly that. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to, the, to a people producing the fruit of it. Producing fruit. You mean God expects us to do something for him? Yeah. In this world, there are givers and there are takers. And there are some who just kind of look on and don't do much of anything. But the kingdom was established by Christ so that we could be taught to be givers, helpers, servants. We are saved to do something for Christ, for Jesus. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, He was the vine and we are the branches. He says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. John 15, verse 2. We are saved to produce fruit for Jesus. One of my favorite verses is in Ephesians 2, verse 10, where it says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Jesus saved us so that we could do good works. Jesus prepared these works for us to do. So that we could bear fruit. So sometimes in our own minds we, we might be thinking that, well I just want to go to church, sit in that nice soft chair, I'll just live a nice life or be a good person. And that's probably all God wants from us. No, I don't think so. Now, there's nothing wrong with living a nice life and having, doing good things. We absolutely should be doing nice things to others and live a good life. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But if our total measuring stick of what producing good works is about, if that is our only measuring stick of what producing good works is about, then we're living our life like a small simple tree in a backyard that maybe sheds its leaves in one day and they all fall in your own backyard so they don't go in any neighbor's yard you're not offending any neighbor that's really nice of that tree to do that but that doesn't produce any fruit 
It merely tries to avoid offending a neighbor. When we have been baptized and we come forward from the baptism or from the baptistry, Jesus wants us to do things for him. Jesus wants us to serve him. I recently read about a church that had grown tremendously over its first couple of years. It started out with about 30 people in a basement and grew to over 500 in just a couple of years. Why did it grow? Well, this church, they had two things that they were ta teaching. New converts were told they had two jobs once they were saved. Job number one was to pray for the church. Job number two was that they were, they were to commit to doing something for Jesus, whether it was witnessing, uh, visiting a sick person, engaging in ministry for the church, serving those who needed Jesus. They were supposed to commit to doing something. And that's why that church grew. But you see here this morning, the point of the fig tree was that Jesus was saying that we shouldn't be satisfied with just sitting in that soft chair and going through the motions of a worship service. Because he won't be satisfied with that. Jesus didn't save us just so that we could have a comfortable life. He saved us so that we could bear fruit. Now there's also two ways we can look at that. Some people view the idea of doing something for Jesus as a chore. It's a burden. It's an inconvenience. They don't want to do anything. They, just, they don't want to be bothered. They want to just be comfortable and attend church and join in the singing and sit in that soft chair. That kind of mindset was reflected in a statement that one elder made to their new preacher. He said to him, Preacher, your job is to get us to do what we know we need to do, but don't want to do. That's really not how God wants us to see that. If we see Jesus, if we see serving Jesus as a burden, we've missed the point. Jesus wants us to see serving him as an opportunity, as an adventure. He wants us to understand that he has faith in us to do these good works, to do these good things. He's paid us a great compliment. He believes in us and he has given us a great gift. He has given us a reason to exist. A purpose for our life. A reason to get up in the morning. In recent years, I have I've seen and I have spoken with some old friends who have retired and decided to take it easy and do absolutely nothing. But after a while, they found out that they were absolutely bored with their lives. Like they felt like their lives had no purpose anymore. So some of them have gone out and to find a part-time job, uh, or maybe they've gone to volunteer at community places. Why? Because God didn't make us just to sit around and vegetate. He created us to be active and involved in life. He saved us to produce fruit. So I want to close this morning with this story that I heard years ago. There was once a farmhand who worked on a farm for an older couple and he lived in a bunkhouse that was attached to the barn and he was paid a weekly wage. And each day he would go out into the fields and tend to the livestock. That was his job, to tend, tend to the livestock. So every day he would, he would walk out to the fields and he would go past the aging barn that was starting to sag a bit and the paint was fading he would walk past those fences that needed some repair, that, that were kind of had some broken uh, boards or, or wires were hanging down. Weeds had started growing along the lane. The farmhouse itself was in disrepair. The windows needed replacing. The siding needed attention. But the farmhand didn't concern himself too much with these things because it wasn't his farm. He only did what he had to do, what his job was. He fulfilled his job, but he only did what he had to do. Then one day, the old family called him into the parlor and sat him down for a talk. They told him how fond they were of him. They were getting on in age, and they had no children, and they had no relatives. So they were going to will the farm to him. One day, it was all going to be his. 
He was deeply moved, and he told them how grateful he was. And as he left the house, he looked around at the barn, the fences, the lanes, and the house itself, and he thought to himself, you know, I need to start fixing things up. What changed his attitude? What changed him was the realization that this older couple believed in him, and they were leaving him a great inheritance. And so now what he did for them no longer seemed to be a chore. He used to see his work as something he had to do. Now he got, saw it as something he got to do. That's the same way with us. Jesus has saved us and given us that inheritance. Now it's something we get to do. Rather than doing, think, doing good things for Jesus and seeing it as a chore, now we need to realize that serving Jesus is an opportunity. If Jesus has come to be our king, that is what he has called us to do. If there is anyone here this morning that does not belong to him or has not accepted Christ as their savior, You won't be able to lay hold of that inheritance that he wants to give you. Today is the day to come. Today is the day of salvation. Make Jesus your king. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the lessons that we see in your word. Uh, portions of scripture that we have often heard and often talked about. But sometimes you point out, point out new things to us, Lord. Thank you for that. My hope and my prayer this morning is that someone here also will have been encouraged and challenged uh, with, uh, with something new as well from, from this portion of Scripture. Lord, bless us as we go from here. May we, able to, may we be able to go out and, and do those good things that you want us to do, that you have prepared for us to do, so that others would also be drawn to you. That is our challenge in this world today to, to uh, spread your word and to make sure that people understand that that inheritance is only for his children. Father, I ask your blessing upon everyone that is here. I ask your blessing upon their day of rest today, whatever it is that they plan to do for the day. Lord, that you would just uh, grant them uh, a peace and a, and a rest and an encouragement so that we are all ready to face the week going forward. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. For a closing song this morning, let's turn to 123. When we all get to heaven, 123, we'll have the benediction after the third verse. Sing that will be.
shout the victory.